Let's start with the basics, Elliot. Why could this be a problem for the president, or, or is it? I mean, he said publicly he would put Clinton in jail if elected. He wanted to use the apparatus of the state, the Justice Department, to stop his enemies. But does the fact that he was stopped matter? Does it essentially absolve him from any possible liability here? Well, the question is, do we live in Venezuela or do we live in the United States of America? This is the behavior of, of people who don't believe in the rule of law. And the most interesting fact from the New York Times piece was that Don McGahn had said that the president had the authority to engage in an investigation, right? So remember, let's separate investigation versus prosecution. The president had the authority maybe to, to open up or ask for an investigation, but it would, be, would have been a staggering exercise in poor judgment to do so. Just because you have the authority to do something doesn't mean that you ought to do it. And it would have been a, a, an egregious violation of the rule of law for the president to start opening investigations of his personal opponents or his political opponents and so on. And so this is, you know, this, this transcends politics and sort of the normal, you know, Democrat versus Republican bickering about what's the latest thing Donald Trump has done today. And this strikes at the core of what law enforcement is and how it's used uh, in the United States of America. This is the president attempting to use uh, the, the, the prosecutor or investigative apparatus of the country as his personal hit squad. This is just not appropriate. And yeah, so, but appropriate sorry. is different from illegal. And Jeff, we mentioned the parallel what? between what Trump talked about doing and what Richard Nixon did. I read part of the second article of impeachment against Nixon. Here's uh, part of that. It says, disregard of the rule of law, he knowingly misused the executive power by interfering with agencies of the executive branch, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Criminal Division, the Office of Watergate Special Prosecution Force, the Department of Justice, and the Central Intelligence Agency. So my question for you, Jeff, is can any action, an affirmative act to set in motion using the government, whether or not it happens or not, constitute an abuse of power? Well, it was in Richard Nixon's situation because he tried to attack his opponents. He also tried to kill an antitrust case. And he was at, at one of the counts, excuse me, against him for his impeachment was abuse of power. And the parallel to Donald Trump is really striking here. Uh, and also, you have to look at it this way. If he makes a request or floats an idea is that an order or is that just a request if it's coming from the top person in the gov government, Donald Trump? And uh, I think Donald McGahn's separation for this in the memo is a bit disconcerting because uh, an order from Trump or a request is basically the same thing and it could constitute an abuse of power. The question is, will it be part of Mueller's uh, memo to the Hill or memo to the court or will, or will it be part or memo to the Department of Justice or will it be part of some sort of lawsuit? Well, Shannon, we laid out the memo that McGahn had drawn up about the potential consequences if Trump went through with this. We don't know if he even read it, although he has a history of not reading things that are put on his desk. But clearly, <coughs> McGahn could have given him these bullet points. But do we know why he didn't and hasn't followed through on these threats, especially since, by all reporting, it's still eating at him? Well, I mean, those are valid points that were raised in those memos that um, many lawyers would probably give uh, if they were asked their advice on this. Um, and I, one thing I will note about this memo, if there is actually something in writing, then that's something that is subpoena that the House Democrats can subpoena and request. It's something that um, Bob Mueller and his investigators could subpoena or, uh, you know, if the White House doesn't give it over, if they don't already have it. Um, so I would point that as far as something in, in writing. Um, now, I mean, of course, the, the president's own lawyers have argued in the past that the president does have the authority, as one of the guests before me was saying, to request an investigation. So, and also laid out in McGahn's memo, it's not saying that the president can't request his Justice Department pursue something, but he can't order it, he can't force them to do it, and he can't force a prosecution, which would actually be, um, you know, finding some sort of criminal wrongdoing, especially if there's not any criminal wrongdoing there. Um, but I do think this fits into this bigger, um, you know, issue here. And to your question about is this something he's still fuming about, 
I mean, I found in these two years that the, the public President Trump and the private President Trump are often the same. Often <laughs> the Twitter feed is a reflection of what he is telling his aides in private. So if we see him on Twitter continuing to complain um, that he believes that Comey leaked classified information or he believes Hillary Clinton should be prosecuted uh, for her email use, even though Comey decided not to. Uh, I mean, those are certainly thoughts. If he's airing them publicly, he's also airing them mm -hmm. privately, and they should be an indication of where his mindset is as well. Yeah, which brings us back, Mike and Ron, to this ver one versus the other, the political versus the legal consequences. Uh, politically, this is no surprise what the president has wanted. He's talked about it. He talked about it before, and he's talked about it since. A having said that, uh, does this in any way change the political equation? Now that Democrats are going to be in charge of the House on Capitol Hill, could it, could it lead to something? I've already heard some people saying, you know what, this is not where the Democrats want to necessarily go with this. Let Mueller do what he's going to do. Outside of the legal realm, are there any political consequences of this reporting, which has uh, set off a firestorm, frankly? Well, I think we need to invent a word to describe this odd liminal space between the totally outrageous and unbelievable and the totally predictable. Because so often with Trump, he does this thing that is so outrageous, and yet we should have expected it because he's been saying it all along. But that said, that's why I think it's kind of priced into everyone's opinion of Donald Trump. And if I may, just to present some defense of him, and I don't want to get hired by the Trump administration when I do this. I don't think there's a danger of that, but yes. go ahead. Although, you know, I'm... <laughs> yes. There's so many slate empl ex slate employees <laughs> That's in the That's right, right but now. we know, we yeah. know what his uh, human resources department is usually TV news. However, um, isn't there some pause that we should give if, in fact, most of this information seems to be coming from Don McGahn based on his description? And what happened was the president was perhaps just batting ideas around, asking him what are the legalities, and McGahn forcefully informed him that this would be a terrible idea. Do and you buy that, Ron? Do you buy that? <laughs> well, I mean, to, to a point, and I, I'd love the, worst of the, the use of the word liminal because that, that was a new one to me, so I think you already in, invented one for me. Thank you. Um, now, listen. I think if there's a McGahn memo that is in the hands of Robert Mueller, as we heard before, or possibly in the hands of a, a Democratic congressional committee. He that interviewed may... Don McGahn yeah. for days. Yeah. His team interviewed him for days, I think, back in August. So I think we can Over pretty much hours assume is what Maggie Haberman that we know that he no. knows and, and, what's in this report. And, and, and kudos to Mike Schmidt and Maggie Haberman for, for, you know, for pulling this one out. But it, look, I, I do think it, it points to this Nixonian tendency, this, this enemies list, a, it, not just a political problem, but indeed a legal problem ultimately for this president if if he were in some other capacity acting on this, this is something that Maggie Haberman pointed out in an interview yesterday, they are unsure as, whether the, as to whether or not the president circumvented White House counsel and has installed other people in certain places in, 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 with respect to the legal uh, structure of the United States that may be undertaking some of these investigations already uh, rather surreptitiously. And so I think if that's yeah. true, that presents a much larger political problem than when we, what we just know from yesterday's reporting. Yeah. In the meantime, Shannon, I, I, I do want to talk about something you've reported on the president submitting written answers to Mueller's questions, but refusing to answer anything related to his time in office or allegations of obstruction of justice. So where does that leave the investigation? Where does the investigation go from here? Well, I mean, the next steps will probably be that the president's uh, lawyers submitted these questions late yesterday. Uh, Robert Mueller's team will look them over. Um, the president's lawyers are then expecting maybe in four or five days for Mueller's team to get back to the president's legal team uh, and either tell them, you know, this satisfies what we were looking for or to ask some follow up questions. The hope on the president's legal team then, uh, though, I can't vouch for how realistic it is, is that then uh, these questions would be enough for Mueller to wrap up at least a part of his investigation related to the president's involvement during the campaign in any sort of Russian election interference efforts. L However, L there is still, well, quick, yes, I will say, there is still a big uncertain here, and it's completely unclear whether Mueller thinks that way about this at all. It is still very possible that Mueller could ask um, additional questions, questions about obstruction, which were not answered, and he could still request an in-person interview. For Mueller, this might just be a first step, a jumping off point, but the president's legal team is certainly trying to frame this in the context that this is the end, folks, about to go home. Yeah, that definitely is the way yeah, they're trying to frame it, Elliot, but what do you think the chances are that, uh, that Mueller goes a step further? Well, it depends what, just like Shannon had said, it depends what's found in the documents. Certainly Donald Trump and his lawyers do not have an interest 
in the president sitting down uh, with, with Mueller and his team just because the president would be a disastrous witness. We know and we've seen him talk before. But certainly, you know, the president can, can, can state executive privilege as the reason for why they don't want to talk about some of the obstruction issues and so on. But at a certain point, you know, executive privilege cannot be a shield to law breaking. And if there's a lawful basis and if Mueller has a basis for going going further on the, 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 um, on the obstruction of justice questions, then certainly they can request further written questions. I think that would be the first step. And then depending on how that goes, potentially get the president to sit down. But as we all know, trying to take that next step is going to require a lot of litigation and a lot of time. And so uh, you know, we're, we haven't seen the end of this obstruction of justice question. It's not going anywhere, and it's probably going to Yeah, service. Jeff, and it would seem to me that, that you know, trying to get the president to, to come before and answer questions in person isn't the only thing here, obviously, that could, right. could delay this from being wrapped up the way the White House has been saying uh, they'd like to see it, or I guess the president was promised at the end of last year that they were about to wrap it up. I mean, here you've got Matt Whitaker, who's been on the record supporting the prosecution of Hillary Clinton, uh, the possibility as Maggie Haberman said, something else is going on that we don't know about. Where do you see this all right now? Well, well, Chris, I don't see this wrapping up anytime soon. And you have a number of pending indictments. You have, you have a number of potentially unsealed, uh, excuse me, sealed indictments. And that, that is what I wanted to follow up on with what Elliot just said. We don't know if, in fact, Trump has already been subpoenaed because there's been litigation in D.C. with the chief judge under seal. There are sealed uh, proceedings going on. There are sealed indictments. And we don't know whether this subpoena issue has already been litigated in the D.C., DC whether it's been argued before the D.C. Circuit, and whether it's ripe for the Supreme Court. Mueller may have already subpoenaed Trump, but just we are not aware of it because it has not been unsealed. And we know that Mueller has uh, kept his ship from leaking uh, for a very long time now from the very start. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.